podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, friends, uh, welcome to today's webinar. And today is a big day for us. We, we have with us uh, Professor Dr. Tajinder Singh, who is uh, well known to most of us. He is a professor of pediatrics and medical education at SDRD Institute of Medical Sciences and also the national convener of uh, the ACME and former director of CMCL Famer Regional Institute, a BC Roy Award winner and the person who has laid the foundation of medical education as a subject in India. He is well known all over the world and he has brought, uh, I mean, he is the most of you must have seen his lecture in many of the conferences in India. He will be speaking on competency-based assessment. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sanjay. Good evening, friends. And welcome to this webinar on competency-based assessment. As I speak to you today, in fact, I can see a big excitement. The new curriculum for Indian Medical Graduate 2019 has already started. Many of the colleges have started with the foundation course and many will be going on to other entities shortly. If we look at the five major pillars of the new curriculum, they would stand out as foundation course, early clinical exposure, integration, skills training, and electives. If you look at it this way, that none of these is really specific to competency-based medical education. There is nothing against having a foundation course with conventional educational system or having integration or electives in conventional system. In fact, if we look at the 1997 regulations, uh, many of these things did find a mention over there, although not as explicitly, but there was talk of integration, there was talk of skills training, there was there were electives during internship and so on. So what distinguishes the new CBAB curriculum from the existing curriculum that we are having. And the only answer, in fact, I can give you is the assessment. It is the assessment which is going to make a success or a failure of the competency-based model. And therefore, it will not be an exaggeration to say, if you ask me what is competency-based medical education, I would say, it is nothing but a good assessment. Competency-based medical education does not require a specific teaching learning methodology. I don't think it is possible for anyone to peep into a classroom and say, oh, this teacher is teaching competency-based and go to another classroom and say that this teacher is teaching uh, the conventional model. That is not so. But what differs is the process of assessment. So what we are going to do today is to take you through the modalities of competency-based assessment and then share with you the NCI recommendations on implementation of competency-based assessment. I made it a deliberate choice that we will not spend too much time on NCI recommendations because they are already published and I hope and believe that many of you would have already downloaded it and read through them. If not, maybe after this webinar, you can read and download. So major focus of my presentation today would be to take you through the basic concepts, the basic principles, and how we can apply these concepts and principles in assessing a competency-based medical education. As I present to you the various uh, facts, as I present to you the various underlying assumptions, I would suggest that you, in your mind, try to relate them to the existing assessment practices as well as to the MCI document where a lot of new assessment practices and procedures have been uh, given out. Now, let's begin with what is competency-based medical education? You must have read this definition. The Frank and Etel defined competency-based education as an outcome-based approach to the design, implementation, assessment, and evaluation of a medical education program using an organizing framework of competencies. Now, if you have to have competency-based 
assessment then naturally it has to revolve around the concept of competencies and as you can rightly see here both not only student assessment but also the program evaluation has to actually revolve around the concept of competencies now on top of the slide you would be able to see the stages of competence that represent reverse model and if i were to divide them into various levels for example novice would be level 1 and uh, expert or master would be level 5 so what defines competence in terms of this model it is the difference between level 3 and level 4 that means if the student is able to do something with minimum of supervision then he is competent in that particular aspect so please keep this in mind whenever you assess your students that is the benchmark which we have set for ourselves that the student should be able to practice the competency with supervision on demand that is he he may request you to come and assess him or observe him or guide him but most of the times he is able to perform the competency on his own now before we go to the mechanics of competency based assessment let's have a look at some of the common misconceptions about competency based assessment one of the very common is that competency based assessment is a performance based assessment and actually it stems from the fact that many a times we relate competencies with only skills so in other words what it means is that if you can do something you are competent if you cannot do something visible something explicit you are not competent but it is not so as you must have seen in the competency document released by the medical council you would find that there are a whole number of knowledge competencies there are a whole number of attitudinal competencies which may not result in a external performance second is that training records and log books are assessment again a very common misconceptions please remember that log books and training records are a process of education and as i told you in the definition of competency based education it is the outcome so what the trainee goes through is not really important what he can do at the end is what you are looking for third that assessment of soft skills is not critical in competency based so you focus mainly on hard practical skills injections nasogastric tubes aspirations number punctures and so on and then competency based assessment can be valid without assessment of competencies now this is where i want to specifically bring your attention to because as we will see a little later what generally happens is that we break these competencies into a various objectives depending on knowledge skills attitude communication etc and then try to assess them now it's good to deconstruct a competency into various objectives but whether those objectives will reunite to form competencies is doubtful in fact if stacking of objectives knowledge skills attitude communication etc could result in a competency then come to think of it there was no need for a competency based medical education the competency based medical education came only because we were finding that the graduates had individual knowledge of the knowledge skills attitudes communication etc but they were not able to really integrate them to perform a whole task so please keep that in mind that as far as possible the assessment for competency based assessment has to be for the whole competency and the most important that competency based assessment can be a single event now nothing can be farther than truth because as i will take you through the various factors you will realize that competency based assessment can never work with a single assessment as such you know people like john morsey very rightly point out that single assessment howsoever well performed are suspect because what you are capturing is only a snapshot observation you are not really looking at the progression of the student as a whole so let's look at these four or five common misconceptions and then try to build in from here now conventionally we have been looking for the fact does the learner know 
and that has been the focus of our assessment. So all our questions and practicals and clinicals, they focus on this component that is does the learner know. But when we move on to competency-based modeling, then your question changes to can the learner integrate the behaviors to care for patients? Because let's not forget that you are training a student to take care of the patient. And if he's not able to do that, it doesn't matter how much he knows. In fact, in last uh, National Conference on Health Professions Education, uh, when we were sitting in the Jurhat uh, Auditorium, there they had put a very nice card which said that patients don't care what you know unless they know how much you can care. So all competency-based assessment has to be targeted on this factor alone. That is, can the learner integrate isolated knowledge, skills, attitudes and communication to take care of the patient. If he cannot, then knowledge is not important. Now, coming to what Hombo, a well-known figure in assessment, has said about uh, competency-based assessment, is that it is actually a process of producing evidence to make a judgment or a decision, pass, fail, progression, repeats, and so on, about whether the person is competent in relation to a particular standard so that means you are working on a grid it's not just a two-dimensional figure so you are looking at the individual you are looking at the performance and you are looking at the standard which has been set for that particular person and this has very important implications we will shortly come to this part but please remember this definition that the purpose of competency-based assessment is to produce evidence. And here, again, producing evidence is crucial. Some of you who have been through uh, some of our training programs would remember this example, that the amount of evidence that you collect depends on the stakes. If you jump a traffic signal, for example, no evidence is required. The traffic police will just say you jump the signal and you will be fine. But if it's a case of homicide, then even a confession is not enough. It has to be proved beyond doubt. So same thing happens with student assessment. You are collecting evidence based on the stakes involved in that particular scenario. Now, there are various assessment challenges, in fact, which uh, face us. And the major obstacle, if I may use that term, that I see to the implementation and success of competency-based model is the problem with assessment. Because all this teaching learning and other paraphernalia which we have designed is not really going to produce competent doctor unless we assess them with the purpose of competency. Marcini very rightly said that the CBME requires by definition a robust multifaceted assessment. Now, that becomes important. It's not just assessment of one task. Second, and very important, that no single assessment method is sufficient. So you will come across people who would say in our time, long case was there and it used to assess everything about the student or new generation will say, now we have OSCE, which can assess everything about the student. But unfortunately, none of the two positions is right because no single assessment method is sufficient to provide you enough information about the competence of the student. Next, that students and teachers, all of us in fact, are programmed into norm-based testing right from our school days. We are more interested in how many marks I got in comparison to A or B or C rather than how much I actually got. Now that can be a problem. Because if you start comparing the students with one another and you lose sight of the standard that you have set, then CVMA is not a success. So the assessment from norm-based testing has to move over to criterion reference testing. We'll come back to this point <coughs> a little later. And competency cannot be viewed dichotomously. 
you know it's not that you are competent or incompetent there are whole whole lot of stages in between uh, as you can see in this uh, chart the refers and refers model so there are many stages and in fact you can again have multiple we are not used in india that milestones but you can have multiple milestones which will tell you about the progression of the student from the stage of novice to the stage of expert and master competency based assessment definitely requires more time more resources and more opportunities compared to one time assessments earlier it was so easy you can give only one send up and one university examination and the task was over but probably that doesn't work with competency assessment definitely more time is required definitely more resources are required in terms of faculty in terms of so uh, many kings in terms of a skills lab and so many other things we'll we'll deal more about that most of the competency based assessment actually emphasizes direct observation you have to see the student actually performing a task and this is crucial because your developmental feedback depends on your assessment now if your assessment is based on proxy or surrogate methods that is a student can do this so we presume that he has knowledge of this and so we presume that when he encounters a patient with this disease he will be able to take care of that then obviously we are going to be wrong so a major emphasis in competency assessment is on formative function rather than only on summative aspect and i cannot uh, stop emphasizing and reemphasizing and reemphasizing the fact that it is always the formative assessment which is the backbone of competency based model rather than going in for summative assessments now challenges don't end here in fact they continue even beyond that and what are the further problems is that most of these competencies cannot be captured by the objective assessment tools you go to any conference medical education conference you go to any meeting in your university in your institution anywhere and everybody will say we must have objective assessment methods now that is where the problem starts objective methods may be all right for simple basic level skills you know recording blood pressure or recording weight or recording height but when you when it comes to for example counseling a patient when it comes to for example explaining the prognosis to a patient you you cannot use objective methods of assessment they destroy the concept of competencies and as i said earlier the deconstruction of the competencies because if you use objective methods then you have to break the competency into multiple smaller and smaller and smaller things and sometimes this deconstruction is so excruciating that it reduces the competencies to meaningless entities i came across a very interesting description by my teacher wendell luton tell in one of the papers he and lambert schubert the both of them they wrote like this that there are some competencies like for example you have a bicycle now you can dismantle a bicycle to the level of the last screw and then you can reassemble that bicycle and you will have a bicycle back but if you try to disassemble a frog for example you will never be able to get a frog back now there are some competencies which are like bicycle you can deconstruct them you can objectively assess them but there are a whole number of competencies which are like a proverbial frog you deconstruct them and they lose their meaning and therefore the bits of information that we collect by deconstructing the competencies do not tell us if the student knows whether to use this information or how to use this information let me illustrate it with the one more example let's say the competency is that the student is competent to 
safely insert IUD in uterus. Now, this competency requires a whole lot of sub competencies or domains, whatever you prefer to call them. So, they should be aware of the anatomy, they should know its indications, contraindications, the procedural knowledge, equipment, and so on. But if in the end, the student cannot insert IUD safely, then all this assessment becomes waste as far as competencies. So your assessment is still has to be based on the fact that is the student able to insert a IUD safely in the uterus. I, I hope I have been able to uh, convey the meaning. Let's move on further. As I said, that assessment here is not against one student versus another student, but it is against a set of criteria to establish the competency. And these criteria have to be established beforehand. I hope you notice this difference. Then in conventional assessment, I'm sure many of us have been examiners. And when we are making the final result, uh, my apology for saying it in Hindi, but then generally they would say, ha, theek tha, usse to achcha bataya tha, chalo, pass kar dete. We do not compare the performance with the desired student. And therefore, competency-based assessment has to match the evidence that you collect with the standard that you have set beforehand. And what are the standards for us? The competencies in the booklets, which have been released by the Medical Council. They have already defined what the student should be able to do. So you have to compare the performance of the student with the standards which have been set beforehand. And unlike conventional assessment, students have to be involved in the process of assessment. As I'll show a little later, competency assessment cannot succeed without involvement of the students for various reasons. Let's have a technical names for these. So in other words, competency assessment has to be criterion refreshed. It has to be evidence-based and it has to be participated. So when you design competency-based assessment for your school or your subject, keep this in mind. You have to compare the performance of the student with the standard that you've set for yourself. You have to collect sufficient evidence commensurate with the stakes involved. So in a classroom test, for example, you don't really need too much of a evidence. But in final university examination, for example, it has to be substantial. And when it comes to selection tests, for example, PG entrance examinations, then it, it has to be even more than what you usually collect. So I hope these three things we would remember that competency-based assessment is criterion referenced, it is evidence-based, and it is participatory. Let's continue with this. Assessment for competency-based education has to be organized around content rather than format. This is a very important point. Generally, what happens is that we give an essay question of cardiovascular system, a short case of renal problem, long case of CNS and viva around uh, preventive aspects and so on. And then in the end, we add everything and come out with a grade. Many of us who are clinicians would identify when I say that we do not add RBC count to blood sugar divided by blood urea multiplied by serum creatinine to the power of uh, SGPT and SGOT because they are all lab values. We don't do that. But when it comes to assessment, we combine everything together. All practicals are together irrespective of what we are testing. All theories together irrespective of what we are testing. So structuring your assessment around content. So if you have a long case on CMS, try giving an essay question also on CMS. Try putting MCQs also on CMS. Have a viva on CMS. 
so you'll have a better information about the competency of a student and as i said earlier most of it has to happen at the formative level at the classroom level so it's not impossible to do rather than having one piece from a and one from b and one from c try putting same content together rather than just going that all practicals together and all theory together irrespective of what we are asking over there secondly competency based assessments they value quantitative as well as qualitative data now again i am uh, quoting from one of the papers uh, by wendel luton and lambert schuber where they rightly said that most of us do not make a diagnosis by looking at the lab reports only we have to take history we have to perform physical examination we have to take the socio cultural background of the patient into consideration and then use lab tests to corroborate or refute our diagnosis same way and very nice analogy they have given that if you try to assess your students only on the basis of marks and scores it is just like trying to diagnose a patient on the basis of lab report without even examining the patient now summative and formative functions again have to be integrated but there comes a problem and what is that problem that there are a lot of decision moments so you have to decide whether the student should stay back or move to next prof you have to decide whether this student should get distinction or just pass you have to decide whether this patient this student should get first position or second position now since all these kind of decisions are required and it's our natural tendency to use all assessments for the progression of the student but once you do that then what is actually happening is that we are taking away the for learning function of assessment because whenever you use assessments for deciding pass fail students will try to hide their weakness they will not like to let you know where they lack and if that is not happening if you are not able to detect lack of competence and by the way i just wanted to clarify here that uh, when we say competence the other end of the spectrum would not be incompetence it would be a kind of discompetence because most of the students would know that they have to do something only thing is that they are not doing it right so if you are not able to detect discompetence then the problem is there and especially in competency based education no assessment can be completely submitted because then you will have no opportunity to improve the learning you will have no opportunity to help the students to acquire and to sharpen their competencies but there is a problem and the problem is that purely summative promotes test taking behavior but at the same time if you have purely formative it will have no serious takers you know you cannot tell the students come on today i am going to give you feedback you sit in my class maybe once or twice they may come but after that probably they will not so the message is that you have to combine the purely formative and purely summative functions into the same test and you have guessed it very right that internal assessment provides us one of the best opportunities to combine the summative and the formative aspects of assessment at the same time you know where the student is and you also know what the student is lacking you get an opportunity to provide a developmental feedback and you provide an opportunity for the student to improve this is just a representation you was paper again that you have multiple assessments spread over the course so depending on your stakes for example one system to another 
two or three assessments may be enough, more than enough. And when I say two or three, it doesn't mean two or three formal ones. It could be informal. Even in your lecture, for example, you could have a mechanism to assess the learning. You can have things like uh, one minute papers, you can have muddiest point, you can have clickers, you can have uh, color cards, just to let you know and the students know how much they have understood. When it comes to medium stakes, have more of more of them together. And when it comes to high stakes, have even more. So it is not that we are going to make decision only on one assessment. Rather, we are going to make an assessment on a combination of assessments and depending on the stakes involved in the process, you can pick and choose. I told you earlier that I'm going to emphasize repeatedly on formative assessment. It's supported by educational theory. Brian Hodges paper 2007 very likely said that providing feedback to the student helps to improve their performance. When students engage in deliberate practice, I'm not going into details of all these terminologies. Uh, you can Google them if you want, or maybe later sometimes we can uh, discuss on that. So when the student engages in deliberate practice, their expertise develops. Students need coaching, mentoring, and feedback. And most importantly, feedback is crucial in competency-based medical education. Now, a little while ago, I talked about uh, quantitative and qualitative data. The same thing, same performance, for example, can be assessed in more than one ways. It could be a number, three by five, two by five, which probably doesn't convey anything to the student. Or it could be a word on a scale, poor, satisfactory, good, very good, excellent. Again, it doesn't really convey to the student that if he's unsatisfactory, what should he do? Or if he's being said good, then what was good he good? So that he can do it next time again. Or it could be a narrative. For example, you appropriately began the interview with open-ended questions and you collected the necessary information and you provided feedback and you looked at the socioeconomic history of the patient before deciding which antibiotics to prescribe. Now, this all provides a much needed information to the student. So qualitative assessment, in fact, uh, many of you who have been involved with conduct of the foundation course would recall that we have been emphasizing a lot on students writing reflections. The qualitative aspect of learning. In fact, as teachers, we also need to reflect a lot on what the students have learned, what they have not learned, and what could we have done better to make them understand. We, in one of our papers, tried to conceptualize the mechanics of competency-based assessment. And if you look at this model, then one thing which would probably have attracted your attention is that majority of the assessment in competency education is formative. And summative forms a much lesser component of the total assessment. Informative, you'll have things like feed up, feedback, feed forward, the learning orientation of the student, self directed learning, and so on. And you would remember I told you that assessment in competency based education has to be participatory. And this is where the participation from the student comes in the form of self assessment. When you heard Professor Jamkar talking about self directed learning, one of the key components of self-directed learning is self-assessment. Because if you cannot assess yourself, you cannot really progress further. Then reflections, one of the very important components. Workplace-based assessment. And all this to be complemented and supplemented by summative assessment. In my mind, I see a change in the role of formative and summative. In our existing system, it is the summative which is all important. When we talk of competency-based, 
it is formative which is all about and unless we provide enough opportunity to the student in the form of frequent assessments in the form of feedback in the form of helping them to assess themselves to reflect on their performance then probably acquisition of competencies is not going to be there so we can have a variety of methods for competency based and you would probably have noticed that uh, i'm using this term evidence repeatedly interestingly there's a lot of similarity between legal practice and uh, teaching practice both have to do the same thing you know they have to collect evidence and then pass a judgment so for competency based assessment you need variety of appropriate methods to collect sufficient evidence each method has its own strengths and its own weakness we do not have the luxury at least as yet to have one magic tool which will assess everything so there may be something good about one tool and something bad about that tool and then you have another tool which may have something different which is good and something different which is bad and then you use the two so that you can counter the strengths and weaknesses by using more than one tools now when we talk of multiple tools the issue of reliability comes commonly we see reliability as reproducibility now when we see reliability as reproducibility then it is affected a lot by content specificity what it means is that today you give a patient of let's say rheumatic heart disease to the student and he performs at a certain level so when we say our assessment is reliable we mean to say that next time when he encounters a similar patient he would probably perform the same level but what happens when he gets a patient of cirrhosis will his performance stay like that or will it change now that is the importance of content specificity the implication is that your assessment has to be broad based it has to cover everything doing competency a well does not mean doing competency b also well you know it's not like that old mathematical riddle that if you can solve 2 plus 2 divided by 4 multiplied by 3 under root 4 then you can easily do the 2 plus 2 part it's not like that you may be very good at doing a complicated cns case but you may not be that good at convincing a patient to adopt a healthy lifestyle these are two different competencies they need to be assessed different and therefore if you may have to make your assessments reliable and when i say reliable that means dependable if you have to make your assessments dependable then the content has to be as much as possible after all assessment is all about sampling better the sample better the results and if you have to use multiple methods then we require the concept of a assessment toolbox the toolbox is just like when a plumber for example comes to your house to repair something and he has a box and there are multiple tools there so he picks up one which is required for that purpose but when he goes to another house maybe he needs another tool if he was to go only with one tool he would probably be ineffective so we may have mcqs for example very good we may have oscis which are very good but you cannot use mcqs and oscis everywhere for communication assessment for example you may have to use something different for self directed learning you may have to use something very different for teamwork something very different so this assessment toolbox is important and so the question comes that do we need new or newer tools for competency based assessment my answer would be a yes and a no no because most of the existing tools can be easily tweaked so to say for competency based assessment 
you do not really need to go in for new and newer tools. But at the same time, we should avoid multiple homegrown tools. You know, as a clinician, as a pediatrician, let's say, I may have resuscitated hundreds of newborn babies. Somebody else may have managed hundreds of myocardial infarctions. Somebody may have operated on hundreds of hernias in a particular way. We all know how to resuscitate a baby or manage a MI or operate a hernia, but still we follow certain guidelines. I do not resuscitate a newborn on my own will. I follow the neonatology forum guidelines. Somebody else has to follow American Heart Association guidelines. And there is plenty of evidence in literature to suggest that protocol based interventions improve patient outcome. On the same premise, protocol based assessments will improve the outcome of assessment. So resist the temptation of going for multiple homegrown tools. Now, another important thing is that value of a tool lies in how it is used. So what it means in effect is that older tools, I don't know if I can call them older, say MCQs or OSCEs, the validity and reliability is built into the tool. So anybody using MCQ would get the same score, whether it is administered by a senior resident or it is administered by a senior professor the student scores are not going to change. Same may happen with OSCE, but with newer tools, mini CX, for example, DOPS, for example, it is how the tool is used which decides its validity and its reliability. And one of the things which we need to develop in our teachers is their ability to pick incompetence or I'll say discompetence. If you do not pick discompetence, if you do not pick up wrong performance, then you are reinforcing that performance for later. And don't forget that when he gets the degree, he's going to be certified competent in all the competencies listed on the website. But if you have not picked up a discompetence, then you are going to have a problem, both for yourself and for the students. More qualitative assessment tools are needed because a lot of competencies, at com model, for example, at com module, for example, the whole of it is qualitative. Hardly any place for a quantitative assessment. Communication, professionalism, teamwork, sincerity, self-directed learning. They all require qualitative assessments. And for some, some competencies, for example, teamwork, now you may need newer tools. So that is the importance of actually going in for assessment toolbox, because then you have multiple tools available to your disposal. There's just one example of assessment toolbox, which uh, we had developed long ago. So as you can see, uh, various tools listed here, for example, clinical encounter cards, mini clinical evaluation, direct observation, acute care assessment, work sampling, and so on. So depending on what your requirement is, you can actually pick up the tool that you need. A little while ago, I said that a good assessment is all about a good sampling. And when we say good sampling, it does not mean a whimsical or if individualized sampling. What it means is to have a good blueprint. And why that? Because not all competencies are accessible at summative examinations. Some competencies are very important, extremely important. But for logistic reasons, you cannot test them at university examination. Basic life support, for example. You would want every graduate who goes out to be competent in performing basic life support. But you cannot do it at the university exam. It has to be done during internal assessments. And from that perspective, 
the formative and summative assessments have to be seen as the two ends of a continuum rather than as separate entities. Please also remember that all core competencies need to be assessed. A competency based education program cannot succeed with assessment of only selected competencies. I told you about content specificity. So being good in one does not automatically mean being good in another. And therefore, you need a certain kind of blueprint to decide which competencies should be assessed during internal assessment and which competencies should be assessed using summative evaluations. Now, one, one of our expert group members, Dr. Krishna Shashadri from Chennai, he developed this grid, and I find it extremely useful. If you view the competencies along two axes, one is their relevance to practice. I gave you the examples, basic life support, for example, extremely important for undergraduate. Placing a central line, for example, maybe not that important or that relevant. And then feasibility of independent certification in the institution. Some skills where you can easily do it, some skills where it will be difficult. So you can place all the competencies into one of the four quadrants. If it is important and if it cannot be certified, then use skill labs, use simulations. If it is important and if it can be certified, go in for certification at whatever level you decide, whether it's summative or formative. Sometimes when relevance is there and feasibility is also high, you explore the opportunities for them to observe and assist. Putting in a central Venus line, for example, let them come and assist senior teachers, let them come and assist uh, residents and senior residents. Whereas for some, it may be only awareness of the skill which is important, you don't really need to go in for assistance. But all this should happen beforehand. It's not that on the day of examination, depending on uh, the logistics and patient availability and so on, we decide whether we should be doing this or whether we should not be doing this. Now, having given you the basics and underlying philosophy of competency-based assessment, I'll now you take you through the NCI recommendations. Now, I believe that most of you have already seen and read and downloaded. So I will not dwell too much of time on that. I'll just highlight the important areas which you need to be aware of. So if you have seen the document, competency-based assessment, which is put up on the NCI website, you'll find that a number of tests have been proposed. So two for every pre and paraclinical and one before the university examinations. Now these are only minimum suggested, but if you want, you can have more. There's nothing against having board number of assessments. Then medicine and surgery have to include allied disciplines. Unfortunately, we have been posting them to areas like anesthesia and radiology and dentistry and uh, psychiatry, but somehow assessment of these areas has been lacking. So proportionate to the teaching time, then foundation course, early clinical exposure, electives, they have to be included in the internal assessment at various points of time. And logbook and day-to-day -day records of the student's work have to be given due importance. But as I said earlier, please do not make logbooks and records as the primary source of assessment. They only tell you whether a student has been through that experience or not. But it does not tell you if the student has acquired that competency or not. So be careful with the way we use law books and day-to-day records. What has come new is that subjects which are taught in more than one phase, proportional weightage has to be given to all years. Medicine, surgery, for example, are taught over a period of three years or four years. Now, what generally happens is that students go for these tests and postings only in the last two years and first three years, they are busy with their pre and paraclinicals. Now that defeats the whole purpose of uh, teaching a subject over an extended period of time. 
Now, to be able to appear for the examination, they will require 50% marks combined in theory and practical, and a minimum of 40% in each. Some of you might have been told during SIS programs about the 35% requirement, and then the student is to come back and make up for all that. So that has been taken away. So now a student requires 50% marks to be able to appear for practical for university examinations, with minimum of 40% in theory and practical each. And another, I would actually see a landmark change, is that internal assessment marks are not to be added to the university marks, but they are going to be shown as separate head of passing in the uh, mark sheets that are given to the students. Coming to university examinations, uh, you would have uh, read that uh, they should ascertain whether the candidate has acquired the minimal level of skills and professional values, etc. Now the change here is that from earlier, where some subjects had one paper of 40 marks and some subjects had one paper of 20 marks, where each question, for example, was five marks. And if a student wrote very well, he got three. If he wrote not so well, he got 2.5. And in the end, by averaging, everybody ended up with the same marks. So to avoid that and get a better spread, all theory marks have been, all theory papers have been made of 100 marks. Most of them have one paper, but some subjects have two. All practicals of 100 marks, except medicine, surgery, and obigaini, which will be of 200 marks. And uh, I hope you have guessed it that uh, separately passing in internal assessment and university examinations is necessary for the students. For the theory examinations and in both the places, internal assessment as well as university examination, it has been suggested that we should be using multiple tools like long answer question, short answer question, multiple choice question, application oriented question. And if you have seen the booklet, then you would have seen the examples of some of the questions which have been given at the end of the booklet. Uh, I don't know if you will be able to recall that or no, but if you were to simply ask which parameter is elevated in nephrotic syndrome, you would still say serum cholesterol. And if you give a little case history and then ask which parameter is elevated, so he has to first make a diagnosis and then think of which parameter. So this actually moves the student up from nose to the level of nose half. If you use multiple choice questions, and again, I like to clarify that it is not mandatory that every university must use MCQs, but if you are using, then they should not be more than 20% of the total weight. If there are more than one papers, for example, medicine or surgery, then the students need to score 40% in each paper and 50% in aggregate. And equally important here is that there has to be at least one question from the ATCOM competencies in each subject. So at com competencies as related to that subject. And this is to make sure that students and teachers take at com seriously and not really just leave it as a secondary thing. The practicals and clinicals should assess the student on what they are likely to see in actual practice. And that means you have to avoid rare cases and rare syndromes, assess their proficiency on data gathering, on uh, physical examination, on uh, making logical conclusions, and other things. Viva OC, the change that I want to highlight is that against the current practice of adding the Viva marks to theory, now the Viva marks are going to be added to the practicals. Now, very often when we talk of uh, subjective assessment, so to say, we actually look at the reliability part. And at a number of conferences and training programs and meetings, the first question that I'm faced with is invariably that this is all subjective. Now the answer to that is that you have to look at the reliability of the entire assessment program rather than on reliability of the individual tools. You basically write the concept of programmatic assessment. And if we look at the published data, what you find is that expert subjective judgments are equally reliable or probably more reliable with adequate sample size. The two things which I am emphasizing here, one, that they are expert judgments. 
So it's not that you put a senior resident to make an expert judgment. So if a professor, for example, is making an expert judgment, though it may be subjective, but it would probably be reliable. After all, all of us have been classifying our students as he is very good, he is not so good. What is internal assessment? It's only formalizing that classification, providing evidence to make that classification. And second thing which I'm pointing out is adequate sample size. Don't have just one assessment or two assessments and base your judgment on that. Have, have multiple tools in multiple settings, multiple cases, multiple assessors. Some of you would remember one of the slides in our presentation, Dil Mage Moore. So this concept of more is crucial to build the reliability and validity of assessment. I'm sure uh, most of you are aware of this concept of utility of assessment. Uh, notional concept derived by multiplication of validity, reliability, feasibility, acceptability, and educational impact. Now, some tools can be very high on validity, but maybe low on reliability. So they can compensate for each other. Some tool may be low on reliability but may have a very high educational impact. It's not to kind of point a finger at anything, but if you look at MCQ assessment or the PG entrance examination, we, you, can, you can say they have a high reliability, if at all, but they have a very low educational impact because they encourage the student to learn medicine from MCQ books rather than from textbooks and from the patients. So they can they can have a very poor utility. So depending on the stakes, unfortunately, for most of the competency-based assessment, the stakes are low. The purpose is not to detain a student. The purpose is not to stop a student. The purpose is to help the student to acquire and to develop competency. And from that perspective, in fact, all tools can contribute to competency-based assessment, whether subjective or objective. I came across this uh, mnemonic, SAFER. So spread assessments throughout the course. And as you read the MCI document, you would uh, appreciate that the recommendation is to spread it throughout the course rather than putting it only at the end of the term or year. Second, have as many assessors as possible. Now this is crucial because as I said earlier, competency-based assessment requires more resources. It requires more teachers. So you cannot afford to have a competency-based assessment with only two senior teachers involved in it. Get everybody in. After all, your residents are also considered teachers. They get a certificate of having a teaching experience of three years. Use them for this. Please also remember that there may be some experience available to the residents and senior residents to take a lecture or to take a clinic. But there is no experience available to them for assessment. Suddenly, one fine day, when they become associate or when they become professors, they are told from no onwards, you will be the examiners. Now, if they are involved right from the beginning, it can provide a much needed experience to a lot of teachers who are involved in the assessment process. Have feedback as well as course. If you have only feedback, there may not be enough takers. If you have only scores, you are promoting test-taking behavior. Then evidence it all with follow-up actions. So not that you give a label of incompetent or discompetent to a student and leave him at that. Rather, you have to make efforts. So when you are, in fact, when you are spreading assessments throughout the course, the purpose is that you should be able to pick up lack of competence early rather than waiting for the 11th month and then to give a hurriedly written test, one test, two tests, so that student can make 50%. The purpose is to 
pick to detect incompetence early so that you can help that student and lastly reflect on what they do the students will have their reflections of course but as teachers as assessors as facilitators we also need to reflect on what the students have learned what we could have done differently to make them learn and what were the reasons possible if they have been able to learn properly now this uh, little picture was made by the october 2016 group of cncl framework when they discussed uh, competency based assessment so some of the things uh, they have very nicely brought out one that it involves a lot of reflection which is based on direct observation then also assess professionalism with the content and context so when you assess communication it is in the context of a situation communication is not a generic competency it's specific to situations asking a mother to continue breastfeed is very different from asking a mother to bring her child for immunization so you have to assess communication with content and context don't forget that the backbone of all this assessment is found by clinical skills and communication skills with lot of contextual feedback and very importantly in alignment with actual working conditions so if you have read the mci document you would have noticed that the recommendation is to have at least one assessment where you are directly observing the student in a situation where he is going to actually work rather than assessing him only in a seminar room or in a ward side lab uh, away from the patient at the actual scene of action so before i conclude let's pose that same question again what is competency based medical education the answer is good assessment so thank you very much for being with me if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer please raise your hands or write your questions in the chat box okay uh dr gurudas khilani can you listen to me sir yes sir i wanted to know that in traditional curricular traditional examination system internal assessment marks were defined and uh, viva marks were also defined but in cbme curriculum these are left perhaps to the universities to decide this is one question second question is the viva marks are now added into practicals now if viva marks are added to the practicals what will be the final uh, absolute uh, number of marks for practicals minus viva marks or plus viva marks okay the first one that uh, internal assessment marks are now not to be added to the university marks they will be shown separately and the student has to pass separately in course about uh, viva marks they will be added to practicals out of total 100 some marks will have to be devoted to the viva so it will not be 120 for example it will be 100 only but out of that if for example you are talking about the clinical subject and you can have 50 for a long case and uh, 25 or 30 for short case and another 20 or so for viva but as far as medical council is concerned they have left it to the discretion of the universities because basically assessment falls in the university domain and they can discuss and decide about where and how many marks to be won thank you sir can i ask another question yes yes please do sir internal assessment in the new curriculum cbme is almost continuous and requires a lot of the labor by the all faculty members now if internal assessment does not contribute to the grades or percentages or the uh, say rank 
then the students as well as faculty members will be discouraged to work hard. Well, it uh, depends, sir. Uh, apparently, yes. One of the explanation is what you have said is right that if uh, they do not have an incentive, they may not work towards it. But the other side of it is that if they see value in it, if they find that it helps them to improve their competencies, it helps them to better their learning, then they would take it seriously. In fact, as I said earlier, that most of us have been programmed into that mode that everything is marks. Competency-based assessment, everything is not marks. Everything is about learning. Not just what you learn, but also how you learn and what could be done better to make you learn. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Anshu. Anshu, can you speak? Yeah. Uh, sir, thank you for that uh, thought-provoking uh, webinar. There's so many questions in my mind at the moment. I don't know which one to ask. Uh, I particularly um, like the fact that you tackled the myths, especially that we have to change our mindsets about norm reference versus criterion reference. But the question I want to ask you is that uh, in teaching, we keep talking about integration. What about integration and assessment, uh, especially when you're talking about preclinical and paraclinical? Um, don't we need to emphasize more on the contextual and the um, the integration uh, part which you're talking in terms of learning should it not appear also in assessment? Yes, actually, you are very right. Uh, that uh, most of the places uh, where competency based model is working, it's, uh, it works on the premise of clinical competence. So they are not subject based. So somehow we have to work on two fronts. We have to work on competency model, but at the same time, we have to retain the subject based. So we cannot totally do away with subject based assessment. So that has to be there. Some assessment of anatomy, some of physiology, and so on. Because otherwise, departmental boundaries will be blurred. But at the same time, since a lot of integration is going to happen during teaching, and when you have a integration team, alignment team, when you have a curriculum committee, then I'm sure all of you can also discuss as to how you can integrate the assessment also. Because without integrating assessment, if you are again purely going on subject based questions, then the concept of competencies will get diluted something. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Ramesh Gupta. Dr. Ramesh Gupta, can you speak? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I understand that in every subject, a student has to be certified in all the core competencies before he can appear in university examination. If that is correct, supposing a student has not been certified in one or two competencies out of 10, what will happen to him? Well, the purpose of having certification in all competencies is that we have a long period available to us where you are going to assess him. And if we find that he has not been able to reach a competency, then corrective measures can be taken right at that stage rather than allowing him to reach a stage where he has to be detained for one or two competencies, as you said. But supposing after giving all the opportunities and remedial measures, he has failed in one or two competencies before university examination, will he be detained? So these are some things the individual universities will decide. I may not be able to give you a blanket answer for this because each university will have a different perspective on this. They will have their rules and come up with the recommendations. In fact, if you read the NCA document, what it is is that the university should take a guiding position where they should help the colleges to develop protocols for these kind of situations. Can I have uh, one more question? Yes. Uh, in, uh, in my subject, I am in biochemistry. Most of the or other majority of the core competencies are theory based. So how will we certify the theoretical competencies? 
I think theoretical competencies are the easiest to certify. You can have knowledge, you can have integrated assessment and uh, certify the competencies. Thank you. I am not really clear as to why should you have an issue with the certifying a theoretical competency. The problem, problem really comes when you have a integrated competency. There's a lot of story and practical and skill and communication and everything that are concerned. But if you have a straightforward theory competency or straightforward skill competency, then certification is not that good. Dr. Vaibhav Gar. Uh, please introduce yourself before uh, asking a question. From where are you, your institution? Dr. Babab, can you speak? Dr. Ashish Jadav. Ashish Yadav, can you speak? Ashish? Okay. Dr. Brinda Venkat Raman. Hello. Hello, Dr. Ashish. Yes. From? Uh, I am Dr. Ashish. Uh, I am uh, from uh, Rajasthan. Actually, I am from Adanta Institute of Medical Sciences, Professor at Biochemistry. Hello. Yes, ask your question. Uh, please can you can. Uh, can you ask a question, sir? Please. Yes. Oh, sure. Actually, uh, sir, what the toolbox is saying that uh, we can assess the logbook and uh, portfolio. Anji. And the portfolio and logbook is differentiated by that the portfolio contains reflection. Anji. But I am seeing that many of the institute and many of the universities they are preparing only one document that contain both the logbook content and the reflective writing content. What I understand is that uh, this portfolio should be kept throughout the course, throughout the, all the phases, one, two, three, four phases, all the phases. But if this type of document is prepared, then it will remain to particularly one phase only, how it will pass to the other phase and how it, it can be assessed. <coughs> We are, I mean, expert MCI group is going to come out with a prototype of uh, the learning experiences that the student has to record. What I find right now is that many of the, the teachers have published their logbooks and their own, own uh, reflective writing books. So we as expert group of MCI have come out with a standard protocol, which most of the colleges will follow. And you are right, it has to be longitudinal because what competency he has acquired in biochemistry it not be undone once he passes such profession. All those competencies need to be there when he has to practice medicine or when he has to learn pediatrics. So it has to be a longitudinal process. Maybe another yeah. month or so that uh, logbook document might be available. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Brinda Venkat Raman. Please unmute yourself. Okay, Dr. Chetna Desai, please unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Chetna? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, good evening, sir, and thanks for huh? a nice seminar. Yeah, go on, go on. <coughs> ah, Hello. Go on. Yeah. Good evening, ah, carry on, carry on. sir. And thanks for the nice webinar, yeah. Uh, sir, I had a question in the sense that, yeah, can I speak? Hello? Yes, please speak. Hello? Uh, you have self-muted self yourself once again. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, I have unmuted. Uh, sir, my question was, why have we done away with including internal marks in the university i mean the total of university exams because whether we like it or not the fact is the attendance of students 
is affected by this decision. Chetna, there were Hello. many issues. In fact, uh, yeah, can you hear? Okay. Chetna, can you hear? Yeah, I can. There were many hear issues you. with internal assessment, and not only. In yes, sir, I can hear you. Yeah, not only in medical education, but in education in general, in Indian settings, for example. Uh, yeah, you read UGC documents, you read oh. other research. Internal assessment actually is subjected to a lot of misuse. So there are institutions who would be giving 9.5 out of 10, huh. and there would be institutions who would be giving only 3.5 out of 10. Now, this was creating a lot of problems. And I am told that in some oh. colleges that a lot of unfair practices used to go on to oh. let the student get certain marks in internal assessment. Now, the purpose of internal assessment is not to provide a compensation for a poor performance okay. in the university college. If we keep that in mind, then what is probably all right, because the purpose of internal assessment is to help the student learn, hmm. to give him a particular direction to learn, which we should be doing. Now, what, what would happen right. is that if you give him, for example, yeah. 9 out of 10, which hmm. means that in the final university examination, he has to score 4 hmm. marks or 5 marks less. So those were the issues which actually prompted. Yeah. And, uh, uh, added to this was one of the Supreme Court judgments in 2006, where it was pointed out that internal assessment marks should not be added and pass fail should be based individually on internal assessment and yeah. university examination. So I think based on that, it has been built like that oh. internal assessment will be separate and university examinations will be separate. Mm -hmm will be separate. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Munira Hirkani has written in the chat box, excellent presentations with wonderful examples for competencies needing certification. What is your suggestion for its rating in our Indian scenario? scenario? Rating means I'm not clear on the question. What is, uh, for competencies needing certification, yeah. what is your suggestion for rating in uh, in our Indian scenario? Yeah. I'll see if I can find her. Um, no, yeah, Munira, yes, Munir, Munira, can, you, can, can you? Yes, can you speak? Yeah, sir? yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Munira, yeah. Uh, yeah, my question was basically yeah. about uh, when we have these certifiable competencies. So it's not a spectrum of yes or no. So if I want to uh, really grade it, I know we have global uh, ratings, but in it is difficult. Uh, I find it difficult to explain to the other teachers who are not so into uh, medical education how this assessment has to be done or how the competencies have to be certified. So we were discussing like, you know, what should be our rating scale? which makes it easy and also maybe valid for the assessment of these or certification of these competencies. For example, we have physical examination in physiology, say for respiratory system, cardiovascular system. So how do we go about certifying this? Yeah, very, very good and valid point, Monika. In fact, uh, this is something which all of us a few days ago, we had a meeting counselors and the people from ACM. It's high time we have dedicated assessment workshops in our institutions that setting a question paper in the subject. Your voice is faltering. Yes, it has to be done by us. Okay. Uh, next is Dr. Mohit Kumar Mathur. Yes, please speak, Dr. Mohit.
हेलो डॉक्टर मोहित कुमार माथुर कैन यू स्पीक हेलो डॉक्टर मोहित ओके आफ्टर दिस डॉक्टर रूपाली कैन यू अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ डॉक्टर रूपाली कैन यू अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ ओके डॉक्टर सुपे सर डॉक्टर अविनाश सुपे सर हेलो कैन यू हियर मी यस सर आई थिंक व्हाट एक्चुअली चेतना क्वेश्चन वी वेर ऑल डिस्कसिंग एंड वी रियलाइज दैट देयर इज अ लॉट ऑफ मिसयूज बट वन गुड थिंग वी हैव अचीव्ड इज दैट द इंडिपेंडेंट appearing and passing into internal assessment is a very important step because that will itself will bring the value to the internal assessment at least we could achieve that actually and that's what actually dr tejinder was trying to say the second point which munira said what level we have to really reach i think dr tejinder showed that five grade uh, scale so i think we should see at least we are about 3 and 4 three uh, about 3 and if you somebody achieves four it's good So if somebody achieves between that, either we can make it zero to five or zero to ten, but we should see that we are above six to eight or something like that. So that is the exact level of certification which we will have to define. I'm sure we need to work more on that as when we we'll come close to those kind of things in universities, they will have to take that decision. Yes, Avinash. Thank you for that clarification. But what I was trying to say is that we still need to have descriptors of what grade three means and what grade four means. Yeah, exactly. Because without those descriptors, which are developed locally, teachers may find it very difficult to really grade. You're very right. Very right, actually. Uh, Doctor Rohini Bhadre. Ah, so I wanted to ask the same thing, but Dr. Supe uh, sir has clarified about the competency that we have to certify. We have around five competencies in biochemistry which we have to certify. So how do we go about certifying that competency? But I think Supe sir has clarified it to a certain extent. But if I if I can get further clarification on that, would be better. So as I said a little while ago, you need to have a descriptor. That means you have to say that when will you say that the student is competent. Now that has to be decided before. So if you are, for example, asking for a biochemical reaction, so what level you expect him to be before you say he is competent? So unless we provide that kind of a description, assessment may be not really reliable. So all teachers in the department need to sit together. they need to work out on the modalities and also make it aware known to the students that this is what we are expecting from you in assessment actually uh, okay. tejinder what we had discussed was if you have seen the milestone uh, kind of documents there are levels of each of these milestones so we will have to really define the certifiable competencies at different levels and then say that this is passable and this is uh, below this is non passable so it has to be a consensus decision of all teachers and they have to come out with these kind of uh, tables or descriptors as you say so that will clarify the whole concept actually thank you somebody krishna nanda prabhu ek prashn the ni aikla maza dr krishna nanda prabhu sir good evening sir 
Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I have put my question in the chat box already. Uh, again, uh, let me just, uh, what my clarification I want is, uh, how many remedial exams uh, that uh, we can offer in case the student fails to perform? And uh, next is just a question is about uh, when we likely to receive the JMR 2019. Any idea on that? Uh, Avinash, will you respond to GMER? Okay, GMER should be out by next uh, 10 days or so. Thank you, thank you, sir. That it will be out by next 10 days. Okay. And regarding the remedial exams, any clarification I can get, sir? That is left to the universities. So universities will have to discuss in their board of studies or faculty meetings and then come out with the guidelines on that. NCI has not given any guideline on this part because then it would be intruding on the part of the universities. So I think wait for your university to come out with this document and then you will have the answer right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Dr. Chitralekha. No. I thought uh, you forgotten about me. Hello? Uh, yes. Uh, I had already put my question in the uh, question box. Uh, good evening. Thank you for a lovely uh, webinar and discussion. My basic question, I'm internal medicine professor head of department at Baba Sahib Ambedkar College in Delhi. It's a new college. My basic question is with CDME and assessment, especially so much emphasis on internal assessment and um, uh, is this four and a half years enough to do justice? Yes, it is. To sometimes yes, it is people enough, have colleges have batches of uh, 250 students. Uh, yes, is, that is enough. Can we uh, sort of, you know, since reform is happening, this is the time to 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 sort of push uh, uh, discussions on such issues. I feel in my institution it is not possible. A, a fair justice to internal assessment and CBME. So my my view is that assessment internal assessment may continue into internship and beyond. So they, they, definitely there is a case for further discussion on this issue. We we need to give thought. Do we have lofty plans? But uh, do we really? Uh, I don't know whether this uh, four and a half years is going to be adequate to do justice to this plus. Teaching plus, you know, um, assessment of competencies, core, non-core, everything, especially in subjects like internal medicine. Uh. Yes. No, you don't have to give a reply straight away, but I feel since so much is happening, we must pay attention to this point also. Uh, Dr. Chitraleka will consider that and we will yes, we'll tell NCI you, that you can consider that. Yes, because I, I, uh, I feel quite strongly about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for including this point for further discussion. Uh, Dr. Sarla Devi. Uh, sir, good evening, sir. Yes. Hello. Please introduce yourself. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Dr. Sarla Devi, anatomist, sir. Uh, hello. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, it's a very wonderful session, sir. We had very good session. And so many things you have cleared to us. 
I have two questions, sir. One is, uh, I'm an anatomist. So, uh, till last year, we are having a logbook for gross anatomy, where the uh, DOP sessions are most uh, focused. But in the current CBME, that, uh, it is mentioned that no certification is required for gross anatomy. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, please. Um, um, no, yes, yes, I can hear. No yeah. I can no hear. certification. Uh, yes, sir. So how to go about it, sir? Because the dissection, dissection we have every day, that is again a skills. So when there is mention like no certification, so how to go about to assess the skills in gross anatomy? competencies rather all competencies have been so excuse me sir your voice is breaking sir these competencies have been designed by the subject experts if you feel strongly about anything you feel to be included or should not be included it will be to consider it as I'm not able to read your question. Okay. Uh, Hello. Hello, Dr. Ashish Yadav. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Richard. Hello. Yes, please, Dr. Ashish. Actually, I have asked questions, sir, already before. Okay. Uh, Dr. Richard Thaman, please unmute yourself. Dr. Richard? Okay. Uh, she has written in the. Yes, Dr. Richard. Yeah, I have already written. Sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. It was an excellent presentation. I have already, I think, written the question. Uh, that we talk about that subjective assessments cannot be quantified in the same way as objective assessment. Uh, but what will happen to the reliability and validity since the emphasis uh, is more, and even in your talk, it is more on subjective assessment. And even the MCI is saying that, uh, uh, you know, they have not pinpointed uh, about uh, the, uh, you know, MCQs. So we can put on the MCQs, uh, but less than 20%. So I was just asking what will happen to the reliability and validity of subject to the system. Uh, thank you, Richa. As I told that the reliability of uh, any subjective assessment can be improved by two very simple interventions. One performance and second is to increase the sample size. Both in terms of assessments, in terms of tools, in terms of uh, number of competencies that are tested. And there is a lot of evidence to say that subjective support judgments are as good as objective. Uh, Dr. Praveen Singh. Uh, Praveen, can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes. uh, uh, good evening, sir. Thank you, sir, for excellent webinar. I just had one question. Uh, sir, we classify, I mean, we differentiate between... Am I audible, sir? Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Sir, we, uh, we, we, uh, we, we classify... Between conventional and CBME assessment. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, yes, we can. Hello, hear. sir. I'm, I'm audible. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, the, the conventional assessment is is labeled as norm based, while the uh, CBME assessment is labeled as criterion based. But if you see presently also the conventional system, there is a criteria, 50% criteria. So actually, we cannot say that it is totally uh, uh, criterion based, norm based. Conventional is norm based, and CBM is criterion based. Can you sir, just clarify that point? I mean, you are right. But if you look at it like this, that the way we give marks is not really criterion. 
you know you say that your criteria is 50% marks but when you yes, when it comes to actually giving marks then we start comparing who's the best performance other achievements to come team to score the best you know that thing somewhere it comes in uh, separately but as it would be essential to qualify with 50% marks whether marks will be considered as prerequisite to appear in final examination with with regards dr ajay bhat associate professor of physiology mgmmc indore so i presume you are asking whether he should be getting 50% marks to appear for final university examination yes he has to get 50% in total and 40% in theory and practical separately to be eligible to appear okay uh, dr ankit khandelwal he asks uh, does uh, doesn't medical body should first increase the workforce of faculty before in introducing this uh, i would restrict myself to the basics of competency based assessment I don't think I would be able to answer the questions on policy decisions by MCI. Okay. okay. Should there be a central or state medical university implementing this? Doctor G R Patel. Wherever there are medical universities, they have all been uh, oriented to this concept. and they have to start it in their own subjects okay uh, dr rupali sabale please unmute yourself after that dr v chand basha please unmute yourself Dr. Hiren Trivedi, please. Uh, yes, Dr. Basha. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me, sir? Can okay, you please? Sir, in formative uh, assessment, sir. So, in traditional system, also there are three uh, exams we conduct, sir, generally. hello yes but we will take uh, best of two best of two will take the uh, internal assessment performance sir shall we take uh, same or uh, will shall we take uh, average sir because some student will write one exam and uh, second exam will skip sir and third exam will write so sir, in such cases we also are taking according to university rules we are taking uh, best of two only so it is possible in the new system sir so, so now no now three assessments have been made mandatory so he We has have to, to appear for all three. and if he doesn't appear then he may not be able to appear yeah Obviously, another sir to be taken but not of two all the yeah yeah because university according to guidelines so we have we will take only best of two only sir the university guidelines are for the conventional system now with the okay. new curriculum coming in most of the universities will come out with new guidelines i think we yeah. wait for them to come out with what they have in their mind yeah. okay another question is that you cannot assess a new curriculum yes sir uh, please carry on yeah yeah one more uh, question sir introduce yourself sir in the i am dr chand basha sir uh, professor and head fmt from hyderabad sir okay. and vice principal uh, admin sir 
Sir, in the assessment tool, sir, we can uh, try for the open book system, no, sir, in formative exam to motivate students. Yes, okay. Hello. Your university institutions. I may not be the right person to say this. Because uh, it is uh, MCI, we are following that now competency based yes, uh, MCI I, now, sir. I'm not... See, all the examination modalities have to be decided by the universities. MCI okay. has only okay. given broad guidelines. Now to implement those okay. guidelines is within the university. Because you are suggesting the tools of assessment now, that's why I'm asking you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Shirish Patel, please unmute yourself. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, actually, a question I had put on the chat box also, and the same question had been answered earlier regarding the manpower. Okay. Dr. Sonali Garg. Dr. Sonali, please unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Sumanth Kumbagiri Nagraj. Uh, sir, you said the same topic needs to be tested using different tools of theory and practical. But won't it be concentrating too much in a single area and against the principles of blueprinting? Hello, can you hear me, Sanjay? Yes, sir. So my answer is that if you read the NCI document, we have talked of two kinds of opportunities for internal assessment. One is formal and another is informal. So when you do a group printing, you are doing it for formal assessment. But for informal assessment, you should try to test everything related to that competency. It makes little sense to have knowledge of one competency and practical of others. And in your informal assessment, you can easily do that. After your class, for example, when you are teaching topic A, give a theory paper related to that. It's not necessary to have a three hour paper. You can have MCQ projected on the screen. You can have uh, clickers. You can have uh, various other tools of interactivity, which will guide you about what the students have learned and what they have not. Okay. Uh, Dr. Afzal Ahmed writes, will all universities in India frame questions based on competency based provided by MCI or National Medical Commission? Because till last year we used to frame questions based on internals based, based on previous year university questions. See that that is what has been in fact emphasized in the meeting with vice chancellors that uh, a new curriculum requires new methods of assessment. So as I suggested to you earlier, each university, each college, each state, they need to have focused assessment workshops. And don't forget that you are external examiner for some other university and they are for you. So if you learn, you ultimately are contributing to competency-based assessment. So if you set up a better question paper, it is useful for the other university, and if they send a better question paper, then see the students who get to learn more from that. But basically, this all has to happen at the local level. I don't think it can be centrally directed. I don't think it can be imposed from NCA or any other person. Okay, uh, Dr. Sh Shirish Patel, uh, more, I mean, this is over. Uh, then Vijeta Patel, how many marks to be given for internal assessment in total? Earlier MCI recommendation was 20% of summative marks, which is very less for formative exams. 
since internal assessment is not going to be added to the university exam actually that cap is gone so you give out of 100 you give out of 500 doesn't make any difference all that the student needs to do is to score 50 percent and since it is going to be separately shown again that gives you a little more freedom in fact to design internal assessment system and assign marks for internal assessment since it is not going to be added Okay. Uh, Dr. Hiren Trivedi. After that, Dr. Raj Kumari Devi. Dr. G.R. Patel. Yes, sir. This is Dr. G. R. Patel. I have entered my question in my chat box. The upper limit of the examiner should be raised to 70 years. At present, it is 62 years. Can it be done? So these are local decisions, administrative decisions. I don't think I can comment on that part. Uh, can the practical exam be videographed? Again, a local university decision. They have to decide whether to do it or not to do it. Yes, sir. Can we establish a central medical university or state medical university so that the examiner's exam can be uniform everywhere? But I suppose most of the states already have a medical university operational, except one not or two. Not in Gujarat. In yeah, Gujarat, it is not there. Most yes. states have a medical university, but they are as the medical university, UP as a medical university, Bihar as a medical university, uh, Ram as a medical university. Don't have. Yes, sir. So yes. I, I suppose it has to be developed at the local level rather than somebody coming from outside and telling them to do it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Padmanabha TS. Formative assessment means we need to do it on weekly basis or monthly basis. Sometimes day-to-day -day assessment may be difficult. Sir, how to overcome this? Dr. Padmanabha, yes, aims Mandya Tataka. As long as your assessment meets the basic guideline and basic criteria provided in the NCI document, it is all right. You can do it every day only. You can do it weekly, you can do it twice a week. Depending on what topic you are teaching, what competency you are teaching, how many students are there, how many teachers are there. If you remember that formula for utility of assessment, and one of the factors in that is feasibility. So look at that, what is feasible in your setting and perform accordingly. One institution may have more people, you might be able to do it every day. There might be another institution who may not have that luxury available. So all these are local factors which Probably you have to decide yourself. Your college, your university, and others have to sit together and come out with some answers. Okay. Dr. Veena Nayak, in second year, which is now 11 months, there has to be three internal assessments for three subjects and two internal assessments from medicine, surgery, and ob with additional uh, end posting exams. Will it be feasible? Well, the answer is yes. Why not? Okay. Is there any clarification on number of teaching hours allotted to second year subjects since duration has been reduced? Yes, if you look at the... If you have been through this, then you would have received a time distribution various subjects if you have not then gmer when it is released will very clearly define how many hours are allotted to each subject this is all predefined so no local intervention is required okay then Uh, Dr. Chip, 
do we really believe that the present duration of graduate course is adequate for competency based medical education and assessment i personally feel that we are out by at least 1 to 2 years chitralekha khati sharma Uh, this morning only i was reading one paper from us where they have said that they have introduced a three year course in some colleges and they feel that that is more than enough for meeting the health needs of their country so what we need to do is actually have a relook at the competency my feeling is that we need to still cut down on many of them which are not required for graduate education and leave it for post graduates that time should be more than enough See, already they spend five years for UG, three years for PG, another three years for uh, for specialty. If we add another two years, then I think all of their life they would be really not doing anything else. Okay. How about having continued assessment of certain core and non-core competencies during and at the end of internship? again chitralekha khati sharma yes that is being built in so competency does not mean that it ends with the final pro of examination so competency based education is actually a continuum from undergraduate to post graduate so what they have learned here goes beyond and continues even after that so internship assessment can, will be a part just give us give them some more time to come out with all the logistics right now the focus is on first prof which is started so now other things are being worked out and i'm sure they will come out with a uh, module for internship assessment as well uh how to divide atcom modules among different departments any guidelines dr navin kumar and please elaborate what about one atcom question in assessment see this has been adequately dealt with during atcom training and uh, i think your regional center should be able to provide you that information atcom questions are related to each for example about the kadavar as a teacher now can we not frame some questions on that in the anatomy question paper i'm sure we can you, as subject experts you are the best judge rather than me telling about anatomy or physiology questions okay uh, a certain core competencies are missing in cbme in physiology what about them dr sajja shrikant uh, so please write to mci and they would be happy to consider whatever suggestions you give Okay. Uh, is there any assessment needed for interns to find out whether they acquired the expected competency? I think I already answered this question. Okay. That that is likely to be coming out shortly. uh sir can you pl uh, plan for some regional workshop shops for interested and volunteer faculty regarding assessment in competency b based medical education the current situation is not conducive for correct assessment in cbme dr shirish patel i think you should contact your uh, regional or nodal center they should be able to help you out okay can we use simulation in skill assessment dr pradeep barde yes it has to be used and uh, if you have also seen the skill document on the mci site they have already given guidelines and by december every college is expected to be having a skill labs so that is where you can use simulation for assessing lot of competencies in almost every subject Okay. Uh, uh, 
I don't see any more questions, but uh, uh, I'm uh, lowering all the hands. So anyone wants to ask question, please raise your hands again. Okay, Ankit Khandelwal. Ankit, can you unmute yourself? After that, Senthamil Selvi. No, he has written that he wants to hear everything again. So I think the recording will be available and you can post it to the MU group. Okay, yes. Recording will be available, yes. Senthamil Selvi. Yes, sir. Uh, I am uh, assistant professor, Sri Manakalo Nagar Medical College, Pondicherry. Uh, my question is like, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, presenter for a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, my question is like, uh, we have, you said uh, we, should, we in summative assessment, we have a question on ad okay, comp. Yes. Sir, hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please go on. Uh, like that, uh, can we can't we uh, will it not be better if we have a question which, uh, as integration is getting a prominence in CBME, can't we have a question which test all the knowledge of all the three uh, all the subjects in the same phase? Yes, given an ideal situation, I would have done that. But since we also have to operate within a subject or discipline based manner, so some distinction has to be made. So it's a matter of feasibility where you put the marks. That is the reason we have put it like this. But if you could okay. do some integrated assessment on that, it would be welcome. Wonderful. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sarla Devi. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes. Yes, please carry on. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, so this is uh, regarding the... Uh, yeah, assessment of foundation course, sir. Uh, actually, most of the students have joined in the second half of the foundation course. So they missed many classes. So how to go about it? Well, this decision has to be taken by your university and your college. I am not the right person to tell you this. <laughs> okay. okay. You know, some things which are beyond, beyond me. Okay. So one more question is, uh, regarding the summative assessment, uh, is it possible to have it on online? Yes, we can have, but again, the lead has to be taken by the university because they are the ones who are conducting assessments. So, in uh, Baba Farid University, for example, there is a mm -hmm. not an online kind of a thing, but the marking is done online. So, depending on the choice of the university, the funds, the resources, etc., etc. If it is feasible in your setting, yes, why not? It can be done. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for it. Uh, Ashish Jadav. Hello. Uh, yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, please go. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, what I have learned that uh, what we are following the CBME is uh, not a pure CBME, it is a hybrid type of model. So we are mixing the traditional with CBME, both the things are there. So which are the different things that we are not including now right in the CBME, that is pure CBME. What I understand one is, it is our is the time bound. And pure CBME, it is not time bound, it is time independent. So which are the other things that we are not including now? See, Dr. Ashish, uh, whenever we use these terms competency-based or problem-based, any based that you use, there will always be variations. There is a classical form which is being developed by somebody and then there are hybrid forms which people adopt or adapt depending on the local requirements. Now, for example, time-bound, as you gave a right example, I don't think we are at a situation where you can ask a student to stay back for six years or seven years if he has not acquired competency. So you have to keep the time also. So these are some of the limitations which you have to. But as we gain more experience of implementing this program, maybe there will be more refinements and uh, you will find a lot more pure things coming. Okay. Okay. 
ओके थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो आई डोंट सी यस चित्रलेखा यस हेलो हां यस प्लीज यस गो आई ऑलरेडी टॉक्ड अबाउट इट इन सब्जेक्ट ऑफ मेडिसिन रफली 600 कोर कॉम्पिटेंसीज uh and allied apart, apart from that tb chest respiratory derma psychiatry i don't think this uh, is feasible to impart the competencies and assess in this period of time there are colleges with 250 students i don't know how it's going to work out so i my i put it in the uh, my i even typed it out and sent it in writing i feel we should either stagger the competency assessment uh, part at uh, completion of mbbs part at completion of internship or take up a case right now because this is the time for it to uh, extend the course Because it has far-reaching implications. If we feel it now, we are going to be, you know, sort of again not doing justice to medical education. So that is my point. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Captain Jyoti Modi. Hello, sir. Uh, this is Dr. Jyoti Modi from Bhopal. Thank you, sir, for a very lucid and engaging. Uh, webinar uh, my question is on knowledge assessment in competency based uh, teaching learning uh, when we assess knowledge whether for phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 uh, as we understand that if competency is to be assessed it is application and judgment so there is full scope of scenario based questions is there any scope or any utility of questions which say short note on or describe csf or enumerate do they have any role at all because as much as i can see there is unless applied knowledge testing should uh, has to be at a level where there is judgment being assessed so even for phase 1 even in anatomy the question should only have some scenario and application which is in future going to help us Yeah, you are right, Jyoti. Uh, in the booklet, we have given some examples of application decisions in a two-based question. One of the limitations that we have is that we still have to operate within a discipline-based uh, environment. So I suppose it will take some time before all departments actually realize the importance of integrating data, including those competencies into their assessment programs. So let's wait for so on Roland. Uh, I hope it will pick up shortly after the end of six months, nine months down the line. So we will know what is happening. Thank you, sir. So uh, I think it's uh, just been two hours and seven minutes. Uh, we end it now. I don't see any more hands or. Oh, and no more chat questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Dr. Shoaib Jankhawala. How to assess relative writing of students, reflective writing of students, as far as at com model is concerned? Uh, Dr. Shoaib Jankhawala, Assistant Professor, Microbiology, Parul Medical College, Gujarat. in the sis training we have provided them with certain guidelines on how to assess reflective writing so i think when he attends those sessions in his institution he will get a more clear answer to this issue okay dr afzal ahmed competency of university which you are telling uh, at local level uh, is uniform uh, in assessment how will we compare rajiv gandhi university of health sciences versus maharashtra university versus ccsu 
there will be a gap like before in spite of having same competency for every subject some difference will always be there in all india institute for example and a remote college in some um, the difference will always be there but since we have already defined the level of competency so every student has to reach that competency in fact competency based education is a means to ensure uniformity of training rather than promoting the differences in training. dr sushma chavan i think this will be the last question dr sushma uh i think she has lowered her hands now so uh, thank you sir uh, would and uh, super sir would you like to make the some closing uh, vote of thanks oh no no thank you so much tejinder for making it very clear presentation and as dr tejinder said over a period of time all people will absorb this and they will come out with many other their ideas like scenario based mcqs new methods i think it will really seep in into the system and let's see how people cope up with this kind of load thank you sir so uh, with this we can end with the thanks to dr tejinder it was uh, a very lucid talk and the recording will be available by tomorrow evening okay thank you so much thank you sir